Okay, can you can you hear me? Is it is it working? I guess is the question. Now go this route. Hello. Hello, checking, check. Nick, can you hear me? Oh, okay. We're good to go. I'll, I'll just go this route then. Um, okay, so sorry about that. I guess I'll start over. Um, so this is setting up a U8 development program. Um, I've been calling it grassroots over the past year um, because it falls in line with what um, the U.S. soccer's terminology. There's some clubs that call it an academy program, but because of the DA now going through U12s, I think that that term could really set the wrong message for what you're trying to accomplish and probably even give you the, the wrong type of parents that you're going to want for this type of program. My name is Brian Seifert. Um, so I have a national B license. I've coached just about every age. You can get a good chunk of my bio on the NorCal site. When I first started coaching this age group, um, parents and, and coaches were asking, uh, did you get demoted? You know, who did you anger? Why are you coaching your weights now? But, um, my wife and I, we have three kids and she had pretty much told me I needed to spend time with my own family. And you know how, how that is as a coach, you have a nine o'clock game then a three o'clock game, 45 minutes away. Sunday's the same thing. And the following weekend, you're at an out-of-town tournament. So um, I asked if I could take over this U8 program at Sac United. She said, yeah. And um, it was it worked out for us because our kids trained at the same time and location and the, and the weekend commitment was limited. Um, almost immediately, I, I fell in love with the age group. The, the kids came in as a blank canvas. They didn't have any preconceived ideas. They just want to have fun. Um, they are willing to try anything that you ask them to do. Um, do you have no pressure on the kids to win? Um, there's no screaming, fighting parents. Parents aren't complaining about their kids playing time or if they can play forward. So it was really just a lot of fun, and um, which is the reason I pretty much focused on this, this age group for the past eight or nine years now. So the benefits for your club are pretty obvious. Um, for why you would um, want to start a U8 program. The one thing that sticks out is after my first year, or actually during my first season of this, our U9, U10 director had said, well, I guess we don't have to worry about fielding U9 teams this upcoming year, which was always a question mark, wondering if enough kids were going to come to tryouts. So we were going into, to um, by the time I, I left SAC United, we were, going into trials with two boys teams and one to two girls teams. And once we got the kids in, they really wanted to stick around and, and play and continue on through the, through the system. This is not a uh, comp soccer. Um, so with, with all kinds of uh, competitive sports now, whether it's comp softball, travel baseball, club volleyball, um, AAU basketball, Parents, because I teach elementary school also, and this is something that parents talk about, comp soccer, they, it's time plus money plus travel equals competitive sports. And so this is not a competitive program. And I, um, I was at a 4v4 event just as a spectator and overheard one coach say to another, well, our numbers are down. Don't these parents want their kids in comp soccer? And no, they don't want their seven-year-old in comp soccer. It can be a scary it can be a scary thing, and and so this program that uh, that I'm gonna, that I'm presenting is is not what would what would fall under uh, competitive soccer. Um, this is the, the format that I use called an in-house playing format. Um, it's similar to what they do in Netherlands um, for this age group. Belgium they actually play two v two in this type of model. And for the six-year-olds in Spain, they also do a similar model, this scrimmage um, model. I ran this, um, this model at Sac United for six years. And then over the past year, I've been helping um, clubs around the Sacramento area um, get their U8 program uh, up and running. 
And so under this model, we don't create teams. Um, originally, I had thought about creating teams, but then my thought was, well, what if the games are lopsided? Um, then what do I do? So under this model, we don't assign them teams. We assign them a game time. Um, originally based on their age, usually the first one, we kind of set them up by age and then we adjust from there. And we put the younger kids uh, first and then the stronger kids usually in the fourth game. And that way I tell the parents, you know, if your child's a grass picker, we stick all the grass pickers on one field and, you know, somebody's got to play at that point. Um, this also under this model that gives them an opportunity to stick around and play in more than one game. So I tell the parents, you know, the parents say, oh, I can't be, I, we can't be there this weekend. We're going to grandma's for a birthday. Hey, no big deal. Go to grandma's, have a good time. You're not letting the team down. Somebody will take your spot. And so it's really nice to see kids run over to their parents and ask if they can stick around and play in more than one game. And, and then by the fourth game, the parents are like going, Oh, but we have to leave. Okay. Only a half. And the kids come back all excited. So, you know, we want to keep them coming back. We want to give them more opportunities to play. Um, as you know, the more touches they get, the better they're going to get. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's sports, music, crocheting, the better you get at something, the more fun it is. Um, so this under this model, they don't just get one game a day. If they want, if they want to play more, the opportunity is there. So this program is a lot more player centered. Um, what I've seen too, the some of the problems with cross club competition is that the focus is on winning. And even though you you know coaches or um, Clubs will say, oh, no, this is a development program. We're not about winning. Again, you, you'll hear these coaches talk um, and say, you know, the first thing they ask is, what's the score of your game? Well, if you're a development program focusing on player development, then why are we asking about the score? And so, um, you know, in order to be really focused on player development, you have to take the team aspect out of it. And if you want it player driven or player centered, again, you have to take the the team aspect out of it um, because when you create teams, you create team behaviors. And when clubs start playing against each other, it becomes a competition. It just is kind of the way it's worked. So um, this video clip is of a, um, a 4v4 game. Let's see if I can get it to work. Um, so, um, So this is, um, we play um, 4v4, obviously, that's uh, US soccer recommended. We play four seven minute quarters. And um, the reason we do that is because at the end of the quarter, the coaches that are managing the games will get together and ask how the games are going. Um, and that way we can kind of adjust the game. Oh, I'm sorry, so choppy. We can adjust the game um, accordingly. So if the games are lopsided, we can move. Um, players to different fields, or we can move them from yellow to white. Under this model, it's not mini soccer. It's not mini 11 v 11. So all restarts are on a dribble. Kickoff is on a dribble. Goal kick is off of a dribble. Throw-ins are off of a dribble. We don't do any corner kicks. I call it international small side rule. If the ball goes over the end line, it's, um, it's um, the defending team's ball. You can see too, there's no coaches. Uh, look at our parent group. Look how in, they're just kind of, this woman's even reading a book. So they're not super, um, they're not screaming and yelling. They're not running up and down the sidelines. They're not yelling at their kid. Um, they're just really allowing them to play and, um, you know, try to get better. Again, there's no coach. This is me managing the game. And the only fouls we call if it's, it's some kind of unsafe play. But for the most part, we just let the kids play and um, and try to get the games to be as level as possible. So every kid's active. Every kid gets the chance to touch the ball. Every kid is um, is part of the game. So there's not really – there's not a kid dominating these games. We, we mix it up so we make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so if you notice, too – I can get this going. Um, I use these six by twelve um, um, skills goals. 
because what I found is when you use the four foot pop-up goals, um, you can get a kid that stands in front of it to block it, but, or you'll get eight kids crowded in front of a goal. And then the focus is on, you know, then the kids don't get to score. So in this, and I'm, I apologize, it's so choppy. Um, um, and this is one seven minute quarter and there's set, there's 10 shots on goal. And I know that because I clipped this together um, and that's not uncommon. I, I recorded three games and in each of the games uh, we had 10 to 12 shots per quarter. I like the scores to be high eight to seven, nine to seven, uh, you know, eight to six. Um, I want a lot of kids to get an opportunity to score. And it's great when a kid scores and they're holding up three fingers to their parents on the sidelines. And I've scored three times because I don't care how old you are. Scoring is so much fun, especially in a game, in, in a game where you're wearing a uniform. It's, you know, it's, it's why, <laughs> it's why we like to play. It's what keeps us coming back. So I want to give the kids multiple opportunities to score because when it's fun, again, they're going to want to keep playing. What I've noticed too with the four foot uh, pop-up goals is that the focus becomes passing and receiving and your, the coaches will yell, pass, pass. Um, they're not in their develop, develop, that's not in their developmental stage. And again, you're not building a solid individual player if you're encouraging them to pass. Um, So why does this program work? Why should why would this model be better than uh, any other type of model? I ran this program at Sacramento United for six years. Um, the season before I took it over, there were about 20 kids. And when I left, there were around 212. And so you don't get that kind of growth if if something's not going right, if people are, un, if people are unhappy. Um, also, the parent reaction had always been very positive. We, we would get a variety of players. Um, we get the player who um, scored every, almost every time they touched the ball in their in their in the program they were in, and then the coach isn't playing them very much because parents are complaining that that kid scores too much, and they don't get to touch the ball and look at the scores outrageous and we're losing, or you get the kid who isn't very good and they never get to play and the coach doesn't play them the half like they're supposed to, and so under this model. Um, player ability varies. I've had players with uh, learning disabilities or physical disabilities. It doesn't matter because we're going to put them with a group of like ability. And so they'll get to, um, they'll get a chance to touch the ball and play. I also don't separate boys and girls. Um, I keep them together. What I found is that the girls tend to make the boys smarter because the girls uh, will have a better understanding of space. And the boys tend to make the girls a little more physical because they'll 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 go in on tackles. And so, at this age, um, gender um, is is not that much of a difference as far as size. And so, um, mixing them by by ability and not gender, it has always been um, a very positive way of doing it. And like I said early earlier, um, we were going into tryouts, U nine tryouts with with enough kids for teams. So parents are bringing their kids, they loved it, they're staying, and they're looking to move up uh, through the system. One thing um, you wanna do is create a curriculum. That's what's gonna separate you from a lot of other clubs that have U8 programs, a common curriculum. Um, when I was at the US uh, Club Players First Conference uh, in 2015, I was having lunch with these two college coaches and they're they're like, oh, yeah, you wait, just throw the ball out there. They'll figure it out. Yeah, okay, so if you sent your first grader to school and the teacher just threw Harry Potter in front of them and said, ah, read it, they'll figure it out, you probably wouldn't be too happy. Well, it's the same thing. I know in a lot of countries like Brazil, they do a lot of scrimmaging. But those kids also play 30 hours a week plus. Our kids play three hours a week. So you can't just throw a ball, ball out there and expect them to figure it out. You have to give them um, – some understanding of ball mastery in order to get them to manipulate the ball the way they want. And that's what in turn makes it more fun. My motto is be a ball hog. And I actually wrote an article for soccer journal, which is, which they accepted and I don't know when it's supposed to be out. And it talks about how the developmental stage uh, for U8s uh, 
passing receiving doesn't fit under that criteria of what of where they are developmentally so we as as coaches and teachers should focus on what it, their strengths are um for their age and then um you know get them to to work at their best um also working with your u9s u10 coaches um, your technical director to, director to find out what kind of um, foundation you want these players to have uh, makes for a seamless seamless transition for these kids through your club. Um, I'm a school teacher. Teach I teach elementary PE, and my um, my my uh, lessons have three components. There's agility, coordination, a technical, and then some type of game. So. A lot of times you go into uh, tryouts and the pair and the coaches are focusing on the athletic kids. Well, we shouldn't exclude exclude kids because a seven or eight year olds not doesn't quite have the coordination yet. Well, there's ways we can help them gain the coordination. Um, this is an activity I do called around the cone. Um, and the things I focus on um, for agility coordination are running, skipping, galloping, side shuffle. Uh, running backwards, jumping, hopping. We do reaction, balance, running mechanics. So the focus is long-term athletic development. Helping these kids be athletic makes them um, makes them more able to play multiple sports. And which is what we found over the years is is beneficial for for their physical development. Tag is also a phenomenal game. Um, kids love tag. It's great way for them to use a lot of their different um mechanics um and and stopping and going and so forth uh the technical component is um i do um, the dribbling skills that i focus on are the fake take the chop the hook the scissors for guiding we do short touches and long touches which you saw in the previous clip um, the turns that i like to work on are the inside foot turn, the outside foot turn, the pull back and the sole turn. Um, and then I do shooting, laces only, lace only shots. This activity is called um, target dribble. And it usually doesn't move this slow, but I kind of space the kids out so you kind of see the, the video clip um, a better. But um, I, there's a book by Doug Lemov called Practice Perfect and he talks about naming your activities, it helps the kids remember what they should be doing. And the example he uses in the book is um, rondos. So if I took everybody watching this and said, all right, uh, get in groups of four, we're gonna be three V one rondos. I think everybody would know what that means. Well, it's the same thing. You name your activity and then, you know, you're, you're cut down on your, on your explaining time and you, you, the, the kids get to play more. Um, the other tie up, uh, the third component I do is a, uh, is a game of some sort. So this is called King's Court. It's just 1v1 across the line. I do um, a lot of 1v1s, 2v2s, defend the line, defend the zone, which aren't defending drills. They're just more of a passive defender drill. And then I do a lot of the Corver games, 1v1s as side goals, 1v1 to backwards goals. So there's some type of, of game that we're giving them an opportunity to apply their skills. Um, U.S. soccer under their play practice play model, I like that. Um, and when the kids, a good good way to do that is when the kids get there, as kids come in late, the kids that show up earlier on time, you put them in 1v1 games. I like to play with them 1v1 or 1v2 because it gives me an opportunity to model um, some of the skills that we're working on. And, you know, you do a charisma chop and then they want to try it. And so um, that's always a lot of fun too. The kids love to love to play against the coach. It's um, it's just a lot of fun. It's this is what makes it fun. Um, so, for me, uh, so this is a training. Fun equals functional. I stole that from Chris Malinab, who I worked with with the Republic. So this is a training session. You have a um, agility coordination, a technical, uh, some type of game, and then a four v four game at the end. Um, whatever I do, let's say we practice uh, Tuesday, Thursday for an hour each, whatever I do on Tuesday, I do again on Thursday because you're going to spend a little bit of time explaining what the activity is, but 
the next time you do it on Thursday, they already know what the procedures are, so they could, so they're getting more touches on the ball, and the and the kids are there to play. They're not really there to hear you talk. And I'm sure we all know coaches. They create these phenomenal drills. They spend an incredible amount of time showing the kids what they need to do, and they stop it and fix it because it's can be complicated. And then by the time the kids figure it out, well, it's time to move on to the next great drill I just created. And then the kids don't get to play that much. So I repeat trainings throughout the year too. I re repeat activities because again, we want them to touch the ball as much as possible. One kid, one ball is um, part of what I've done almost from the outset of, of um, coaching this age group. When the kids are bored, they start to throw grass or kick each other. And when they don't have a ball, they want to take somebody's ball. So um, under this, you know, you, you're giving them an opportunity to play. So setting up the program, you're going to want to start now. Um, get this set up for your, for the spring. Um, right now, I had one parent tell me, um, soccer season's baseball signups and baseball season soccer signups. So right now, not every kid wants to play uh, baseball, softball, or swim. So parents are looking to put their kids in a spring activity. So they're, right now, they're looking for something to sign them up for. Soccer can be an option for them. Um, and during the spring, you're not competing against recreational programs. So it's just an, another option for them. You're going to need about 40 kids to run this type of program, which, I mean, you can run it less, but 40 kids is a great number because it gives you more game time options and, and it gives you a better way to separate the kids. Um, so the earlier you get organized, the better. One of the first things you're going to want to do is hire uh, somebody to be in charge, director, coordinator, lead coach. You call it what you want to call it. But you have to have somebody that is able to organize and run the trainings. They're always at the trainings. You can't have somebody coach three teams and then do this. It's just, it just is not going to work. For a lot of parents, you're, you're the introduction to their club. This coach is going to be the introduction to, to your club. They want to be able to have a connection with your club and a connection with the person. If they want to, if they walk up to one of the staff coaches and say, oh, I have a question about whatever. Oh, Coach Johnny's in charge, but he's way over there with his U12 team. So that's just doesn't send a good, good impression uh, to your parents. You also need somebody to um, assemble, assemble a staff, but somebody that is, um, um, you know, somebody that's able to, to take the lead on everything and is visible. Um, you're also going to want to advertise. Um, flyers for schools is great. This is a process. You can't just print a thousand flyers and drop them off at a school. You have to go to the district website, find out what the procedures are, what disclaimer you need, and get it approved and then print it. And then you're going to want to collate them um, by number of kids in a class, by the number of classes. You bring it in and you're very nice to the secretary um, because if you if you give them a stack of flyers, they're going to they're going to throw in the recycle bin. They don't have time to sort that stuff. I've even offered to sort, you know, to put them in the teacher's boxes for them. Most of the time they say, no, no thank you, but they appreciate the offer. You're going to want to get this on the, your website, get this on social media. Do you want to offer free camps? It's a great way to get people out to your club to check it out. It is, um, you know, you can end up, I've had this happen. You have 20 kids and then the next week you have 200 and then you're running over to the U18 girls team and asking them and the coach, if you could borrow his players for an hour because you're swamped. They're always super nice about it. They understand this is helps promote the club, but it can be a bit stressful um, trying to make sure it's staffed correctly. Um, player costs. So I like to charge whatever little league and rec soccer are charging in your area. This is not a money maker. You can't say, oh, okay, we're going to charge $300 and we're going to get a thousand kids or a hundred kids. How much is that going to be? It just, you want to, you want to give a price point where parents are going to come, come try it out. This friend of mine whose kids don't even play sports. When I told him about this, he, um, he thought, well, that's a great idea. Uh, because once you get them in, they're not going to want to leave. And that's a lot of times what happens. They're going to try it out for a competitive price, for a price that's reasonable. They're not going to try it out if it's too expensive. And you don't want to price people out. You want to give, you know, every 
<clears throat> every kid an opportunity. Again, um, parents can be turn, turned away by the term competitive soccer, but you get kids in, you can talk about your scholarship program, um, and it gives everybody an opportunity to be included. And if not, then what I've done is at the end of the season, I give parents the option. This is our club. This is what the costs are. This is what the commitment is. This is another club. This is their commitments a little less. And so each, you know, you give them the options. They appreciate it because, you know, honesty and is, um, you know, is, is a way that, that you keep people around. What's it going to cost your club? Well, your club costs are, um, um, sorry, i got to look at my notes here. You're going to need goals. That's a one-time cost. Um, mar a field uh, markings. So if you get a field and, you know, maintenance, field maintenance, painting a field, I think it looks great. When a field's, field's painted, cones, I mean, it works, but I like it to look really sharp. It just gives a really good impression. I also like these... Um, these uh, pennies that, that have the logo on it. So Nadia here, great picture. Mom throws it on a Facebook page. Well, what if she's wearing a red a red penny? I mean, what, two thirds of the clubs in NorCal are red, so they're not gonna know who she plays for. Um, so if you have a logo on it, it's, it's free advertising. And also it just, to me, it looks really sharp. Um, we only break these out on game days, so it feels like they, they're still wearing a uniform. Then you're going to have the costs for your flyers or advertisement, and then you'll have the cost of whoever your lead coach is or coaches. I've run this where I was the only paid coach, and everybody else was volunteers. Um, there's, you know, there there are you're going to have parents that do have some uh, coaching experience, but I've had coaches. I had a coach that played at Stanford. I had a coach that played at San Jose State, uh, Sonoma State. UC Davis, Sac State. So I've had parent coaches who had some pretty solid playing experience, but two of my best coaches were actually former military. They were great with kids. They showed up on time. They um, were always there. They were always willing to work hard. And that's what you really need, reliable people. So um, that, again, depends on what it is um, you're, you know, you're looking to do. Um, but in my experience, you can do it with volunteers. For me, I don't give a group of kids to a coach and say, off you go. I run the whole thing. I bring all the kids together. Uh, before that, I show the coaches what they're going to do, what station they're going to run. And then um, we divide the kids based on age and ability. And then the coach will coaches will run that station. And so they'll run it three times. And so by the time they get to the third one, they've kind of figured it out. And then the next time they do it on the next day, uh, they're really efficient at it. And again, the kids get more touches. They get some, some good instruction and it just becomes an overall better experience. So here's your checklist. Here's what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to hire a coach, director, coordinator, whatever it is. Um, for me personally, if, if you have a coach who's looking to scale back because they have a family, this is a good a good spot for them that, you know, I could very well, very easily not be coaching at all. But I've known a lot of coaches, it seems, who were fantastic coaches, but they started a family and they reluctantly gave up coaching. Well, this is a way to keep them in your club because the commitment isn't as high. And also they may have young kids that they can bring out and participate with. So an experienced coach. Um, that you know is, is organized and professional and the parents are going to respond to is a, is a good way to go. How much are you going to charge? You're going to have to figure that out. Date, time, and location of your training. I, I do it the same day, time, and location as the U9, U10 program. Parents, you, parents, we, people usually have kids two years apart and it's immensely convenient to drive one location and drop off both your kids. Um, that's a very enticing to a lot of parents. Um, and so you, you're going to get kids that on that way alone. Do you want to offer a free camp? That's again, another decision. You're going to want to set up your registration online or however you plan to do it. Um, we always registered the kids under, uh, NorCal, uh, got them player passes because, you know, don't quote me on this, but I check into it. I believe they're covered by insurance. 
if they have a player pass. And the player pass is good for the year. So I do a spring program and the fall program. I don't do a year-round program. So they participate in the spring, get a player pass. Uh, so they're, you know, they're insured and then they're, they're good for the fall. And then also we've had kids who, you know, U9 coaches are like, hey, I need to add some kids to my state cup roster in case I have kids that are absent. And so we would, we would give, you know, we'd give them a couple of names and the parents were agreeable and sometimes they got to play. We had one kid who played and the kids really liked him and the coaches really liked him. And so he got to play through state cup and actually they won their division. And so it was, it was pretty neat to, for him. It, it was a great experience. You're going to want to design your flyer, get it approved by the school district. Once that happens, that could take a couple of weeks. Um, you're going to want to print and deliver them to the schools. Once uh, parents start registering, um, you want to have the person that's in charge send them a personal email, any additional equipment they're going to need to get, like cleats, shin guards, and so forth. Do you have a training uniform, black socks, black shorts, um, what any other in, other information they, they may need, a reminder about when you start and the location. You're going to want to order shirts. I always went with just a sport time dry fit. I would get them printed. They, um, our printer would print them for me for 10 bucks with the logo on it. Um, sometimes they'll throw their own logo on the back as a sponsor and then give you a reduced cost if you can swing that. Um, you want the kids to all have a shirt the day, the first day. You want them to get a shirt when they, when they show up their first day. Order extras. I sell those off um, just at cost. Um, and so I, I don't leave that up to the, the, the shop wherever the, you're, you're, you're wherever the kids buy the uniforms. I just have them on site. And I had, I, mean, I saw them out of the back of my truck. I had one guy ask if I was selling rims and stereos at one time. So um, that's just, you know, a way to give kids more shirts. Um, you're going to want someone to run the check-in. You can't have your person in charge doing that. You want them running the training because you want it to be sharp. If you have um, <clears throat> parents that need volunteer hours, here's a volunteer opportunity. Again with uh, coaches too, <clears throat> we would have older players do their volunteer hours work in, the, in this program and the kids love the older kids. We would have some of the kids come out to their games or they would show up for our game day and see that they were playing and then wander over and wave at them from the sidelines. So again, you want these people are part of your club and if you treat them like they're part of your club, not just some side U8 program, they're gonna you know, feel part of the club and they're going to show up to some of your other events. On the first day of the training, you're going to want to talk to the parents about the philosophy, the expectations. Um, the first uh, few years we had um, the president of the club would always come out. Uh, Sean Blakeman, our technical director, he would always come out, introduce himself to the parents, or I'd introduce him. It just looks really sharp um, that, you know, this is the technical director. He's in charge of the education of your of your child also so this isn't just some fundraiser on the side this is you know you're part of our club we want you here um if you have any questions you know let us know we're we're all available okay here's some of my contact information i have this blog i started about six months ago i'm doing these uh coaching clinics with the sac republic and one of the coaches had asked if i had a blog so they could um get drills or things like that i'm like oh okay i'll start one so I started a blog. Um, feel free to check that out. It just has a few things I've written along with um, some different training activities. I don't have any videos on it. And then this is my personal email address, which you'll probably be able to see on, um, on the NorCal site. All right. Um, so questions. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead. What age group are they? This is a you... So I do um, U8s. I would start with U8s. I've done U8s and U6s. Um, but um, you can, um, it's, you know, it's up to you. For U6s, um, I do 3v3. I don't do 4v4 because you get, again, when you, the fewer the kids on the field, the more touches they're going to get. So um, I like to... Uh, for 3v3, I do a, on a 15 by 20 field. And then for the 4v4, I do a, 
25 by 35 feel. It actually fits between the build out line and the halfway line on your U7, I mean, on your 77 field. I see some, um, um, yeah, is there questions? You can go ahead and type them in the comment section. You can also drop me an email. So that's, that's pretty much it. <clears throat> Let's give you people a couple minutes to, I'll wait for the, the queue to, to end. <sighs> okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, go ahead and uh, drop me and Drop me an email. Thank you.